This is a story of the plantings and harvests, of want and plenty, of death and life. This is a story of unwavering faith and indomitable hopefulness. This is the story of one family's struggle to survive and prosper as they cultivated the arid high plains of northern Colorado. This is the story of the Bee Family Farm. The story of the Bee family farm begins in 1853, when George Bee and his family arrived in the United States from England. The family settled in Upper Sandusky, Ohio, where George served as a Methodist minister. But all was not happy in Ohio. George's wife Anna and an infant son died shortly after arriving there. In 1861, their oldest son Francis enlisted in the Union Army and witnessed some of the bloodiest fighting of the Civil War. Throughout the struggle, Francis dreamed of joining his brother John, who was a schoolteacher in Iowa, and buying their very own farm. But Francis B. was captured in 1864, contracted dysentery in a Confederate prison, and later died. Without his brother to join him, John B. continued to teach in Iowa. He soon developed a cordial friendship with his star pupil and close neighbor, Fanny Cotton. They were married in 1868. John B. then purchased 80 acres of rich Iowa soil and began farming for himself. He and Fanny had four children, Emma, Minnie, Arley and Garfield. But a diphtheria epidemic swept Iowa in the fall of 1878. Little Minnie succumbed to the disease and it threatened to take Fanny and Emma as well. Emma, awful bad. Fanny taken down about four o'clock. God only knows my anguish. John B. suffered poor health as well. He struggled with asthma, and the disease nearly cost him his life. His uncle hauled freight to the Colorado Territory in the 1860s and recommended that John relocate to this dry, sunny climate. In October 1882, John and Fanny B., with their children, arrived by train in Fort Collins, Colorado, a small farming town on the Cache Laputa River. They took up a homestead six miles north of town. John B. purchased a small herd of cattle. He broke the sod and planted corn just as he had in Iowa. Because the summer was unusually wet, the crop flourished. But the arid climate returned, and after five years of failed crops, John B. soon realized that irrigation was vital to survival. After five years of struggling against nature, he rented an irrigated farm and moved his family. Meanwhile, Fanny B. enticed her sister, Lizzie Morse, to move to Colorado. In 1884, Alan Lizzie Morse, with their son Whitwell, homesteaded two miles east of the present-day bee farm. Al Morse raised horses and provided teams that built many of the reservoirs and irrigation canals in the Fort Collins area. In 1894, the Morses acquired a homestead two miles west, what is today the bee farm. It was claimed under the Timber Culture Act, which provided federal land in exchange for planting and maintaining a certain acreage of trees. Congress based the act on the failed logic that because trees were plentiful in humid, rainy regions, a lack of trees was to blame for the aridity of the Great Plains. A single cottonwood from the original planting remains at the northeast corner of the present-day bee farm. Soon after moving to the new farm, Whitwell Morse died of typhoid. Al Morse died five years later, leaving Lizzie to tend the farm herself. 
John and Fanny B's son, Arlie, had helped his uncle Al Morse by driving a team with a dirt slip. After his uncle died, Arlie moved to Aunt Lizzie's farm, raising grasses and small grains. In 1902, the North Poudre Irrigation Company acquired the original bee homestead to construct a reservoir. In exchange for their land, the bee family received precious shares of irrigated water. The bees then moved their household to the Morse farm, literally. They actually tacked their two-story house onto Aunt Lizzie's small homestead cabin. At about the same time, irrigated water arrived at the newly combined Bee Morse farm, in time for a revolution in Colorado's cash crop. In 1903, a group of local investors completed a beet sugar refinery in Fort Collins, making sugar beets the major cash crop in northern Colorado. The cultivation and refinement of sugar beets required a massive agricultural and industrial infrastructure. With thousands of acres under contract, hundreds of miles of railroads, and huge factory complexes, Colorado sugar companies such as Great Western became corporate titans. The United States Department of Agriculture rated the beets grown in Larimer County as the best in the world. The sugar beet industry eventually eclipsed mining as the most profitable enterprise in Colorado. For the farmer, sugar beets required careful irrigation and intensive hand labor. To meet the demands of hoeings, thinnings, and toppings, farmers hired families of Germans from Russia to tend beet fields. In the 1920s, Mexican laborers largely replaced Germans from Russia. The bee farm hired Mexican laborers through the 1960s. Despite its intensive labor, the sugar beet, known as white gold, also brought a measure of prosperity to Colorado farmers. Arlie Bee was able to construct a new horse barn, sheds, and purchase better implements. New sugar beet boom towns, like Wellington, developed at beet dumps where area farmers transferred their harvest to awaiting railroad cars. The Bee family became leaders in this new town, with John Bee helping to establish the Methodist Church in Wellington. Despite this prosperity, the Bee family was not immune to tragedy. On May 22, 1905, scrambling to cover her garden before an approaching storm, Fanny B. was struck by lightning. My father came in from the field in the same storm and picked her up. She was dead. My grandfather never got over that. He died a year later of a broken heart. Following Fanny's death, Selecta Shaw, Al Morse's niece, arrived from Illinois to assist her Aunt Lizzie with the housework. Arlie B. invited Selecta on Sunday afternoon carriage rides, and soon they fell in love. They were married at the farm on Thanksgiving Day, 1908. Arlie and Selecta gave the farm its third generation of bee children, Marion, John, and Francis. <laughs>